Hi everyone, so I'm Nicole from Interlink and today I will be, as mentioned, talk about uh, sustainability. I received this question uh, in the last two days quite a few times, so what exactly is sustainability and how can you do it? Um, there's been a buzzword kind of going around and you can go into very specific details as well. Um, but today's talk will be more to aim a little bit of an overview. So what exactly it is and how can you tackle it? And in my opinion, this is the first step uh, if you want to become sustainable, to understand how everything is put together and what are the relations. And then um, if anyone has any more questions, I'm really happy to go into further details um, after the talk. So what I'll be talking about today a little bit, um, why is it important for us uh, than terminology? It's important to know what exactly we're talking about uh, because if we know the definitions, then everyone has the same idea and has the same concept in mind. Then road to net zero. So what are the steps you can take to actually become net zero? and then the main pillars of sustainability. So just a little bit of an overview of what we've seen in the um, last one year of operations. So yes, sustainability is important. Um, we've seen the word and heard the word uh, quite a lot and we're aware that it's a pressing issue. Um, it's also there in the news coverage. We have to act. Um, there's some change that we have to make um, and to put it into a bit of numbers, uh, why is that? So by 2030, it's expected that the ICD industry's um, energy demand will be 20% globally. So we have a pretty big chunk um, that we're responsible for. And next to this, um, there's been an exponential growth of traffic um, with more and more people having access to the internet. And this is growing and it's also expected to further um, have an exponential growth. What we currently see in the industry, um, there's a really big variety. So there's a range of commitment goals, uh, ranging from none to becoming uh, carbon neutral or net zero by 2030, 2040, 2050. And there's also a great variety in available reports. Uh, there are a few companies who've been doing ESG reporting consistently for the last few years already. And there are some companies where it's very, very tricky to find the word sustainability on the website. However, we see a general uptick in interest in the topic. So um, there's more and more people interested and want to know how to do and what to do. And there's also more and more associations um, dedicated to the topic where um, volunteers um, or specific working groups work towards tackling some of the challenges within the industry. Um, the importance is uh, further growing and there's been several shifts in the market recently. So there are new regulatory changes that make it compulsory to do these reportings and to have an idea about the topic. There's growing consumer pressure as well, also partially because the regulations, consumers are more likely or could be pressured into even switching suppliers if you do not have a sustainability strategy in place. Um, it also um, more likely that investors um, will give you money if you have a robust sustainability strategy than rather someone who doesn't. Also, employee expectations are growing, so um, having the value sustainability within your company can attract uh, more uh, human resources as well. And uh, the company value is likely to increase uh, overall as well if you have a sustainability strategy in place. So, a little bit about regulations. Um, these are just a few um, that are worth mentioning. Um, there's way more out there. Um, for example, the EU taxonomy and the CSRD. I'll talk a little bit more detail on the next slide about these. EU supply chain law and there are national climate regulations as well. Um, Germany is a really good example for that. For example, there's the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, which was brought in, um, passed in June and is expected to be live already by 1st of January, 2023. This applies currently to companies with um, more than 3,000 employees, but by next year it will be 4,000 employees and it um, has a lot of companies um, now in frenzy because they have to act really fast. And all of these are kind of powered by the EU Green Deal, which was made in 2019. 
and the EU pledged that um, they would like to be net zero by 2050. Um, this is why these are not only regulations that are expected, but there's more to be expected with more standardization and more details to come because the EU is investing also a lot of money and resources into reaching this goal. So EU taxonomy and CSRD, a uh, little bit more details. So the EU taxonomy is a regulation that helps to define if the economic activities of a company are environmentally friendly. So, um, and these are defined by six objectives. So, uh, for example, one of them is pollution uh, mitigation or um, climate change mitigation. And the company has to positively impact one of these six areas and not have a significantly negative impact on all of the others. And that's the only way to become uh, environmentally positive um, in your operations or be defined as one. And this is already in motion, so it started in January 2020, and the rest of the act will be passed uh, from the 1st of January 2023, so also very soon. CSRD, so Corporate Sustainable Reporting Directive, um, this is still in draft mode, but it's also expected to pass um, at the end of this December, so also very soon. And this will make it compulsory for companies with more than 250 employees um, or specific um, financial uh, details to report on their sustainability um, details as well. And uh, this is important because there's also an extension of regulations and standards that you have to follow. And this applies to a really big amount of companies across the EU. And this will also make it, um, this will come into force from the financial year of 2023. And then you will have to report already um, by end of April 2024. So you will have to map all the operations um, for the next year. So this is all good to know, um, but where do we actually start with the definitions? So carbon neutrality and net zero are often interchanged, but these are not interchangeable words. So carbon neutrality is if you have specific emissions of your company and these are um, offset through investments into carbon sinks. So carbon sinks are oceans and forests, for example, and they're called carbon sinks because they um, take in more CO2 than what they produce. And by investing into um, taking care of these resources or sinks, um, you offset your own emissions. However, net zero, on the other hand, already includes all greenhouse gases. So it's not just carbon. And it also aims to reduce these emissions to the minimum possible. So there are some unavoidable emissions because businesses have to operate, but you have to try to reduce it to the absolute minimum. And then the rest should ideally be um, absorbed by these carbon sinks. To have a little bit of a visual to that, so carbon neutral would be if you continue as business as usual, so the red um, line, and then you would need to compensate for the blue and gray areas. Um, and then net zero, if um, you follow the dark blue line, so if you would need to, um, then you would reduce your emissions, and then um, the rest is compensated for. And then if you see, it even goes even further, um, the dark blue line um, below that, and that's a point where you reach uh, environmentally positive operations. So this is an ideal state to reach uh, because eventually we'll have to make up for all um, the environmental damage we've done. So there are some um, researchers saying that it's not even enough to become net zero, but obviously that's the first step. And you can see that net zero here is on 2050. This is because there is scientific research um, on that we should not let global warming go above 1.5 Celsius to have a livable planet. And uh, for that, we would need to become net zero by 2050. It's currently debated if it's soon enough, um, but for now, most of the end goal or final deadlines are at 2050. So what exactly are emission categories? Um, according to the greenhouse gas protocol, um, there are three scopes you can define when you try to tackle your emissions. Scope one is our emissions that your company has direct control over. So these are facilities and vehicles that the company owns. 
Scope 2 and 3 are indirect emissions, and Scope 2 is um, purchased and used energy and electricity. And Scope 3 is usually the biggest chunk, and this often surprises a lot of people because it can go from 70 to even 90, 95% of emissions um, of a company. So it's not enough to look at scope one and two, but scope three is usually a really big part of it. And because this covers your entire supply chain. So we're a really interconnected um, industry. So most of us have uh, several hundreds or even thousands of suppliers. To have a little bit of a more look at it, so scope three even has upstream and downstream activities, so your suppliers, but it also looks at uh, the use of the product once it's out of, out of your hand and uh, your, your customers use it. And when you do the reporting, these are the categories that you should collect or categorize your emissions as. And uh, why is it important for us? As I mentioned, we're a very interconnected industry, so if, um, we all have a lot of suppliers and we really have to, if we really want to make an impact, then everyone should act together because your emissions will most likely um, influence another company's emissions within the industry and it kind of accumulates. So everyone should strive. There's a lot of market players and uh, all of our, us are very interconnected. Um, okay, but how, how do we get to net zero? There are five different uh, pillars or steps that you can have a look at uh, when you want to tackle this problem. So first you monitor your emissions, then you report them, then you set reduction targets. How do you want to reduce them? Uh, when do you want to reduce them? What are the investments you want to make? And then you validate them. So um, this is usually uh, referring to auditing and then you get a certificate at the end of the process. However, what we found, it's very useful to switch or flip this process around. Because if you work from top to bottom, then you can avoid a lot of mistakes or you will not miss uh, some steps on the way. And then it will save a lot of time and a lot of money for you because you do not have to correct on the go when you realize that, oh, there's like another step I would have needed to prepare. Um, so it's really worth to first um, look at everything as a big view because this is not a topic that you can kind of just jump into. I mean, you could, but it's not advised. It's really important to have an understanding because of it at first. These are just a few certifications we've been looking at. Um, there's way more of them and every company should decide which one they would like to get certified with or certified as. Um, we've been looking at B Corporation. We found it's really useful because it covers a lot of areas, um, governance, workers, environment, community. Um, so it covers all the ESG topics and you can work through all the processes within your company. And we've been looking at this for the last past one year. SME Climate Hub. I found this a very useful website. They have a great knowledge hub and they also support uh, SMEs, but for any big company, if you're new to the topic and you want to know more, um, it's highly recommended. Uh, for me personally, it was a great resource. And if you make a public pledge to them, you uh, join the UN Race to Zero, and you can make a public uh, commitment to become at zero by 2030, 2040, or 2050 uh, with them. We've uh, pledged to become at zero uh, with them by 2030. And um, there are also the ESO certificates. Um, these look at different processes or different categories and whether these processes work in the right way. Um, there's several out of them. This is also for everyone to decide which one is the most important. And 1% for the planet. Uh, this is a philanthropic activity where you can uh, donate 1% um, of your revenue or annual salary to this cause. It's great to know um, of them because they really make sure that all the investment goes towards positive impact in the environment. Um, then validation. So not every company needs to be audited right away, not legally um, compulsory at least, and some, some have to, but it's really good to look into them or what are the steps because you might have to on the long run or it's just good to prepare a few steps for you. So what exactly it is or why does it help? So you can identify key players and stakeholders. So who will actually do the auditing? Um, who are the responsible person who will have to do that? 
Um, what is the data collection process? How do you collect all the emissions? The supply chain is huge. Like, how do you really get the processes going that you can centralize all the data? Um, you can also define clear uh, KPIs uh, ahead. So what do you want to achieve? And then you can prepare the processes accordingly. And then ESG reporting um, is also important. So you can already look at them in advance and know what framework is likely that the easiest to audit or what makes the most sense for you. The benefits of this, you can have a clear strategy ahead before you jump into everything. Um, it increases transparency as well. Everyone knows what they'll have to do or what are the processes you'll have to do. And you'll also be compliant with regulations, um, which is a pretty good thing. And uh, you will be also aware what happens if you're not compliant. So what are the risks and costs of not being compliant or not being aware or being on top of what are the newest regulations that you need to comply with. Reduction targets. So um, this is a point that's really interesting to revisit uh, once you've done with monitoring and reporting, because that's when you have an actual data already. Um, however, if you look at it ahead, you can already define a few steps um, as well. So worth to go through the process this way. Because you can already have an idea or an ambitious goal in mind by when do you want to be carbon uh, neutral or net zero and what are the targets you want to set. Also, you can talk to management already. You can let them know what are the requirements, how they should talk to suppliers, um, what does the company need, what are the requirements. And then also you can already communicate across all your employees. So if they know that there will be a change coming and you'll have to change processes once you have the data, then the transformation will be much, much easier than if it comes out of the blue. And then reporting. So I'm pretty sure some of you have already heard the term ESG reporting. So what it stands for is environmental social governance and it covers a lot of aspects of the company. So it's not just uh, environment and not just emissions, but it's also human rights, uh, business ethics, and uh, many other subcategories that spread across the whole operations of the company. But what a lot of people don't talk about, that there's multiple frameworks. It's not just one. Um, there is no specific standardized ESG report yet. Um, it's expected to come at one point, but until then it's really important to have a look um, how it makes sense for you, which framework to choose. So you can have a look at which industry you're in. So do you already have standards? Do you have already reporting frameworks that are best cases or, or um, often used? Um, where are you located? It's very important. What are the regulations? What are the legal requirements um, that you have to adhere to? What's your company type? Um, are you a service provider? Do you sell goods? Maybe you do both. Um, this will also influence what type of reporting you'll do. These are very different. And stakeholders. The question is, who will read your report? Why are you creating this? Make sure that you deliver the valuable input um, that's important to the end audience. And then there are several audiences that you can prepare it for. So investment, management, and government. And often you can even use multiple of them to make sure um, that you cover a good ground. So um, these are combinable. And effective reporting, so um, for C's, um, be concise. Uh, someone will have to read your report uh, to be to the point. Uh, be consistent. If you have reports uh, within regular intervals, then you will be able to compare it and make sure or see the progress over time. If you report or work with current data, um, the business strategy will um, work with the most recent data and not on last year's, and business decisions will be more accurate. And also use the frameworks because this makes your report comparable to other industry players. You can benchmark yourself, you can compare how the rest of the industry is doing. And make sure that all the data that you have is verifiable. You'll have to know where the data comes from and it's important um, to make sure um, yes, that it's verifiable. 
So you can do reporting either internally or externally, um, and both of them have their pros and cons. So internally, it's recommended to use the software. Uh, it's a lot of work to do everything manually, and uh, most likely then the sustainability manager or the team will take care of covering all the steps and all the details that I've previously mentioned. And then there's the external part. If you're in a little bit more of a rush, um, you can also outsource this to consultancies and partners. Um, you'll still need to know and map everything within your company, but the reporting will be done by them. Uh, however, if you want to do this more regularly and do not want to rely on external um, entities, then it's recommended to start to do the internal processes or develop them within the company. And here are three um, names and logos that are worth to know. So um, these help you to look at the um, reporting types and uh, measurements that you have to take. Uh, for example, CDP as a disclosure platform, you can actually, if you become a member, look at other companies' reportings. Uh, you can get inspiration from this. Science-based targets um, helps you to set specific targets, and um, then the reporting index uh, helps you to know what exactly are the steps and categories that you have to report on. So highly recommend to look into all of these. And then uh, last but not least, uh, monitoring. So there are already monitoring softwares out there and uh, well, we like automation, so we do not like Excel tables. <laughs> um, and uh, this is why we looked into uh, quite a few of them and they all are uh, pretty good. They're not the only ones. Um, and it's also worth to look into which one you would prefer. Uh, the points we looked at were um, whether they have an automated solution, do they have an easy integration, do they have regular updates, do they update the data sources, do they update uh, new features, and whether um, it's possible to set targets within them. And if you're already at the point that you've mapped everything and you know everything, um, then that comes the reduction part. So there's already a pretty big growing market out there with companies who help you uh, invest in environmental projects and um, their marketplaces as well as specific offset providers. What I would um, recommend everyone to look into, do you get an acknowledged certification from them? And do they fit? Uh, there are several topics you can invest in, either environmental or so environmental and social causes. What fits best for your company? What are the activities you would like to be connected with? And then the main pillars that we've come across that are very important if you're building a sustainable strategy is you would need the support of leadership and you'll have to have a good governance structure in place because then everything supports the move towards this strategy. At the same time, it's important to have expertise in-house. Um, and if you work uh, with external people, then also look for um, high experts um, because you need someone who knows the topic and knows and keeps an eye out on the new developments because it's a constantly growing topic and constantly evolving topic. Collaboration, so to tackle scope three, you need collaboration within the industry, outside your industry, and potentially also within your company across departments. And to follow that, communication is important. Um, what the sustainability department knows, procurement has to know as well. So make sure that your employees talk to each other and everyone is aware of the topic. Everyone can contribute and everyone uh, can make decisions um, that can enhance the strategy further. And um, we also practice what we preach. So we have quite ambitious goals ourselves. Um, we already mapped all of our uh, emissions, go scope one, two, and three, and we'd like to publish our first sustainability report uh, next year, as well as um, hopefully we'll get our B Corporation certificate. Uh, we already submitted our assessment, and uh, we would also like to make sure that our customers know their emissions, um, so this, their service footprint. And by 2025, um, we would also like, we will become net zero, and um, yes, it's quite a journey ahead, but we're really convinced and committed to these goals. And I'm very happy to, one. yes, so that was it from my side. And I'm very happy to take any questions or talk about more details downstairs at our booth.
Yeah. So, do we have any questions in the room or online? Um, there is one question in the room. I have a question. So, um, I looked at um, some of the reports from big internet service providers, and they're all not comparable. So, some say it's kilowatt hours per gigabit transferred, others say it's amount of CO2 produced per, per gigabit um, transferred, others include petrol for the, for the service technicians, others don't include that. So it's not comparable today. But you said there's EU, EU initiatives and there's tools and there's um, reporting machinery out there. Is there a standard coming out that helps internet service providers report the, the same metrics so that they are comparable? So unfortunately, there's no standardized reporting yet, um, but the three companies or, or methods I mentioned, so the um, GRI, CDP, and the Science-Based Target Initiative, um, they're the most used. So I would recommend to look into a framework um, that has statistics about being um, the most used either across the industry or globally, because for now that's the best we can do. Um, but I expect a standardized reporting framework to come out um, sooner than later, and then everyone will have it a little bit easier and make it more comparable. Okay. So, um, do we have online questions? No. Okay. Um, so, if there's no other questions in the room, as it seems, um, yeah. If there are no other rooms in the mic, in the uh, no other questions in the room, then um, thank you for your talk, and okay. we'll see you later on.